Hello, and welcome to another edition of Florida Sportsman Action Spotter Podcast. I'm Captain Rick Riles. Hey, it's been a busy week around the state. We had a northeaster came blowing through, brought us a lot of water, triggered a lot of bites in a lot of places. Mullet runs on full bore. There's fish inshore, they're offshore. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start out with a quick stop in Costa Rica and check in on my favorite billfish destination. Then we will start our tour around the state of Florida. Up in the northeast, Captain David Borey's We'll be filling us in on what's going on. We'll take it all the way down the East Coast, through Isla Mirada, all the way up the West Coast and out the Panhandle. If there's a fish moving with inside of Florida, we're going to be talking about him somewhere. So get yourself a cold drink, set back, and get ready. This week's Florida Sportsman Action Spotter is brought to you by Yamaha. Reliability starts here by Shimano, bringing people and nature together. By Tournament Master Chum, the best chum on earth. By Nasara Paradise Rentals, your dream vacation. By DOA Lures, the unfair advantage. And by Young Boats. You want the finest in flats, bay, and offshore hybrids? You need to check out youngboats.com. Let's get it rolling with our buddy Craig Sutton from Nasara, Costa Rica. Craig, tell me about life in paradise. Well, I just got home late last night, painted two boats in four days, got three coats of gel coat on them and got our initial 220 cut done on them and it, they came out good. In fact, you know, I, there's nobody that teaches you or there's no class or YouTube video you can go to to really learn how to spray gel coat and then subsequently sand it and buff it and get it to where it looks good. And it's been a, a trial and error process the last 16, 17 years for me. Mostly errors, don't get me wrong, but but we're starting to get it figured out now. And I feel like the, the two boats we painted last week down there is the best paint jobs we've done, and they're they're coming out really good. And, and it's, you know, with gel coat for us, it's environmentally friendly. We don't have a, a paint booth we can put our boats in. We don't have a sophisticated paint gun and all that. So gel coat is our our chosen poison so to speak on painting these boats and it's old school but you know what it works and we get now, it done. now several of my blue marlin and so quite a few of my sailfish too really have scratched the harvester were you able to get all those scratches out of there because because i don't want to hurt your boats oh absolutely yeah you talking about when the marlin well, oh, you yeah, know, when yeah they, that, that one marlin you caught with heidi and jim it poked the bill poked a hole in the lower tally. I did hear Not about yeah, I, I, I did yep. hear you hear about that. We weren't aware of that when we got to the dock, but uh, I know uh, it happened I, on the video. You can kind of you can see, see it. See it, yep. it happened so fast. But then we were pulling the the rub rail off to discover we found a selfish bill, bill that broke off that was stuck up underneath the uh, rub rail. How about <laughs> that? Like, That's crazy. Yeah. That's- I mean, it's, don't think that the the billfish, primarily the marlin and the uh, sailfish, it's not it's hand to hand combat down there. Oh, it Especially is. Those it is. You know, Craig, they're, not, they're not scared of you. They're not intimidated. No, not the least. It appears to me, after being down there for a few years with you, like those big Pacific sailfish are kind of your guys' go to your your bread and butter fish. What what makes your guys so good at sailfish? Well, they've got them dialed in, you know. Yeah, that's our main species, and we catch them all year round. But and it'll be strange because we'll have some two or three, you know, we'll have one school of fish that we'll kind of lock on to and do real good for sometimes two, three weeks, and then we have to find another school. But you know, we've got them dialed in. We use those light leaders, the light eagle claw circle hook, which is really it's not necessarily the kiss of death every day. But when it's hard, the bite's hard, and especially the fish we get, you know, December, January, February, March, that have had pressure on them all the way from Panama, past Capos, Golfito, past Las Vegas, and they get up to us, they'll be a little spooky, you know. And if you don't have everything right, that, that ballyhoo rig just right, the circle hook bridled into the ballyhoo and the light wire hook and you know the teaser and stuff. It's just it's it's different between night and day. Well, let me let me tell you how how I've always felt that I could tell if fish were pressured or not. If they're being pressured 
80% of my bites or maybe even 90% of my bites will come on my shotgun line. It's way, way back. I agree with you, but I'll get that when they get pressure in Costa Rica and the that my experience, and it happens a lot, is they'll come up and they kind of half-heartedly come up. They don't come yep. up in a full-on yep. charge. They just kind of – and they'll whack the, the, the ballyhoo with their bill, and sometimes they'll actually pick it up, but they swim away real slow, and then they'll actually spit it out. Yeah. Yep. Um, I've seen that a lot, or they kind of come up and – look around and then they just kind of lazily swim off and stuff and we get that a lot you know we have to deal with the you know the schools that come up the coast and they did beat on and they you know once they get to Las Vegas during the high season that January February March April I mean they'll have 15 20 25 30 good good boats on them which yeah. you know makes them tough but hey that's fishing yep that's and- fishing well, your guys have certainly dialed it in for your area. I'll tell you that. I've, I've, I've always been impressed with all your guys, but um, uh, sailfish well, it, seems it, to be their, their strongest suit. Yeah, and it, but it's like I was just saying, it's the total package. It's the total sekibahe. It's all the little details that got to come together. Oh, that's that's fishing, whether it's a brim pond or, or that's right. the Azores. It's a thousand little things that have to be done right for it to be good. And that's what keeps you and I awake at night. You know, it, it always oh has. Gosh. And and we're just so blessed at our age to still be so excited about something. Craigie, I know you're ready for your guys to get back fishing. When will they be at it? Well, we're probably going to put the harvester in the boat in the water. That's about the 10th of uh, October, maybe the ninth, And, uh, and then I'm, I'm heading down there right about that time. I'm going to finish up the, uh, putting the rub rails on and some last little bit of details and stuff. And, and so we'll probably put them in the water that last, I think the full moon in October this, this year is the 19th or 18th. So probably two or three days after that. Well, I'm, I'm not up for any of that work stuff, but if you're short of anglers when it comes time to go back down there, let me know, will you? <laughs> I will, brother, man. <laughs> Thank I you, buddy. We will. appreciate it as always. Craig Sutton Thank from, you, Nis- from Nisara Paradise Fishing. Our thanks <laughs> to Craig Sutton for a call from Paradise. His boats are getting ready to get back at it. And uh, let me tell you, folks, that is an outstanding vacation over there. Now it's time to come on home. Let's head up to Northeast Florida and check in with none other than Captain David Boris. David, how are you? Hey, Captain Ricky. I'm doing pretty good, buddy. Good, good. I uh, got a funny feeling with all the mullet I'm seeing pouring by my dock. You probably had a few bites this week. Yeah, you know, it was it was pretty good this week. It's It's been good all week. The, you know, the water temperature is starting to drop, which I really love. The mullet are in the run. Uh, and, uh, man, it's just this is a great time of year for people to get out and go fishing. Uh, it seems like on, even on weekends when we have uh, some of these home games, uh, you don't see quite as many boats out there on Saturdays and Sundays, which uh, makes me very happy. But uh, anyway – with that being said, Rick, it was just an outstanding week and plenty of fish, uh, including a, a, a missed pretty big snook. Uh, mm. we, we, had a, we, had, we had a big one on the line this week. He, he gave us four or five good jumps, um, you know, had the net on the side ready to go, ready to land them, and uh, his gill raker got us and, uh, you know, only using 20-pound uh, – fluorocarbon leader he he made quick work of that and uh, it was over with uh but we got some good views of him and and and, and i know where he's hanging out and uh, <laughs> it, it was outstanding I'll, I'll be looking for him uh, uh the rest of the season but the red fishing has been outstanding this week really good bite um been doing a lot in the flats uh up in the grass i mean it's just you know, you really mix it up good. I've had several clients this week where I was able to show them how we catch reds uh, in, in, in different ways. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, we, we catch them up in the flooded grass, which is really fun. Uh, we get them on the mud flats, you know, when we, we can see these big pushes. And, uh, you know, we even get them out of these deep water spots where you're pretty much vertical jigging and 
you know, it, it, we were some days I go out there and, and one will work and the other two won't or vice versa. And rarely do you get to do, you know, a little bit of everything throughout the day. And I've seen days this week where the bike just went on for the whole four, uh, four hours, had a few six hour trips this week, which I thought was a little long, but we, we, we stayed on fish most of the day and, and it's really, really been good. Plenty of flounder this week. I saw some nice flounder this week, uh, which made me happy and plenty of little, little potato chips, you know, which that even makes me happy because it, it makes me feel like, well, you know, we, we got all these young ones, these little ones that I'm seeing. So, uh, maybe we're seeing a good rebound on the flounder. And uh, I'm hoping we got a close season coming up, and we'll we'll talk about that later. I know there's plenty of controversy when it comes to that, uh, but I think I think our saving grace this week, uh, or this uh, this year, I should say, with the flounder, was the muddy water, and that's the kiss of death for diggers. Yep. Yeah, and you're right. uh, we've had some really really muddy water uh, this year. Some of the muddiest I've ever seen. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, the, you know, me, you know, lo- loving to use the live bait, the shrimp is, it's, they've been working really good for me. Uh, top water plugs, man, this is the time of year, man. I mean, everybody thinks top waters are good in the springtime, but let me tell you, they're really good in the fall too. When these mullet are running, uh, get out there and use these mullet imitators. Uh, they're fantastic. Uh, uh saw some big trout this week. And I like to like to see that. I, I wished I wasn't seeing them the way I was seeing them, but you know, I, I don't like seeing them on the fillet table. But you know, I mean, as long as you're obeying the rules that you know you you, you do what what the law says, I'm I'm, I'm okay with that. But you know, um, it, we we did see quite a few twenty twenty you know people getting there, and and you got to remember the new law now is one over nineteen inches. Per boat, not per person, but per boat. Good deal. So, Good uh, deal. yeah, I like that, yeah, and, and, and that's. I, I think it. I think that's going to help us out in the long run. Let's hope uh, trout fishing is is a mere shadow of what it used to be in Northeast Florida. And you know, I don't. I'm not. You know, you know that better than I do, Rick. It, it's not what it used to be. But uh, you know, hey, we, we made some changes. Let's see what happens. Let's give it some time to work, and uh, you know, we'll 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 go from there. But, hey, mullet, you know, mullet and redfish have taught us we can bring fish back. You I know, know it, Rick, just, and I'm telling you, the row mullet now. are here. Yep, Rick, I've seen schools of row mullet that I haven't seen it like this in so long. It's 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 been fantastic. Just huge schools of row mullet makes me want to go out and get a net and. And pull some in and go put them on the smoker and smoke, smoke me up. some mullet. Yep, yep. I know what you mean. But I got to tell you, I got a whole new appreciation for trout this week. I haven't eaten a trout in I don't know how long. And we, uh, Roger Walker and his girlfriend and I went down to Guanadam. And um, we took a couple of 17-inch fish to to uh, a local restaurant and, and got them fried up. You know what? Fresh fried trout, pretty darn good, David. It's it's very good. And let me guess, Rick, was the wind blowing out of the northeast? Oh, you know it was, and you know I was wading up to my chest. Now it was it was chilly all well, day. You know where I was. For you listeners who don't know, when we get these northeasters, you don't have a boat, you don't want to get out there. Man, Guana is can be a goal. It, it can be a gold mine. Let me tell you, those northeasters flow. Guana is fantastic fishery right there it's it's a lot of fun david it sure is there's no doubt well buddy that sounds really good now i got one quick question for you has the tide gotten okay. low enough on the low tide to hunt for the crawlers uh you know i'm seeing some fish uh, you know but not 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 like i've you know I, i'm not fishing some of my flats this mm-hmm. week was all high water rick i had high water you know, it, it was never got low enough this week for me to really see that. And and we did do some good tailing reds in the grass, which that made, you know, that sort of to me this time of year the exciting thing. Uh, I, you know, low water fishing just wasn't there this week. And mm-hmm. you, you know, if you, I, I, you know, I wanted to get out there early in the morning and get those high tides, the high water, 
And uh, so I really didn't get to see that low water fishery this, this past week. But next week, with these low tides early in the morning, hey, next week I'll give you another report and we'll we'll find out. Maybe they are going to be crawling this week in the, in the shallows. Oh, I can't wait. David, thank you so much. Please tell me we can check with you next week. You know where I'll be, Rick. All right, Cap. Thank you so much, Captain David Boris, from right here in Northeast Florida, and he had an excellent, excellent redfish report. I can tell you a little bit about offshore. It really hasn't started yet. There's a few wahoo, uh, not a lot, but a few wahoo and a few mahi, and a blackfin tuna or two. But uh, it's been a lot of long runs to the Gulf Stream for not much. Bottom fishing still pretty good out in the deep water pretty much non-existent in the shallower water as it has remained warm. The best thing that's been going on offshore has been very close to the beach, and that's a mullet run, and that's tarpon, and that's kings, and that's sharks, and that's jacks, and they're all stacked up chasing, and big reds all stacked up chasing the mullet down the beach. Let's pull down to East Central and find out what's going on with Captain Jim Ross. Jimmy, how are you? I'm doing good today, Rick. How are you doing? I'm doing outstanding. How'd you like that cool weather when you stepped outside Saturday morning? It was absolutely wonderful, but I'll tell you, this morning, Monday morning, was even better. 66 yeah. degrees this morning versus 74 on Saturday. Mm, 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 mm. Now, we didn't get that. We weren't cooler this morning. That's funny. I'll be darned. But it has it certainly... It must, must have filtered on down because... Six... Uh, it was 66 at the house, and it was 68 uh, when I got to Titusville. I actually drove north, and the temperature went up two degrees. How about, yep, that's right. It was warmer at my house. You're exactly right. Tell me about the fishing. Well, our, we had a little bit of a lull in, in the bite here. We had a real strong bite going all last week, and then, uh-huh. and I'll tell you, it kind of slowed down just a little bit. Everybody I talked to said that they, you know, they were kind of struggling a little bit, and myself, I struggled a little bit. We did not get the bites that we anticipated. <laughs> given the fact that we had some beautiful weather. But, you know, we're on the backside of that full moon, and, of course, the morning bite typically isn't as good anyway. So the midday and afternoon bite is going to be a, a better time for the guys and gals to get out uh, here, you know, during the rest of this week and into the weekend, I believe. And then it'll rotate and flip-flop back around, and we'll get back to a morning bite again. Gotcha. So I think it just happens to be uh, the time that we're on the water versus what the fish, you know, not that the fish weren't biting, they just weren't biting whenever we were there. All right, what was biting? Well, we had trout in the lagoon system. Still some pretty good mangrove snappers throughout their entire region, too. Uh, the, the mangroves are biting around the docks and stuff in Edgewater, New Smyrna area. They're also biting pretty good out at Port Canaveral around the rocks there and then down at, and at Sebastian around the rocks there. Snook bite's been solid. Uh, had some really good snook, really good snook uh, prior to the weekend. It was... Uh, one of those one of those cases where you could never get one small enough to keep. They were all way too big. In fact, my wife, I grabbed, I called her and said, "Hey, let's go uh, Friday afternoon." And she actually got one that was forty inches, mm. 40, 40, point, 40 and a half inches. So Ooh, she is now good. a member of the forty inch snook club. Mm, so mm, that's mm. pretty cool. Yep. And those fish are hitting, you know, live baits really good, especially at the top of the tide and the first part of the outgoing tide this week. That seems to be the best bite. Gotcha. Well, that sounds outstanding. Have you heard anything from offshore? A couple of groupers here and there, a couple of wahoos here and there. Yeah. It seems like the guys that are fishing in the mid ranges aren't doing too good. The guys that are getting out there and out to the Ocaline Bank, you know, the steeples and the cones, that 220, 240 foot stuff, they seem to be doing best right now. The, the uh, western edge of the Gulf Stream kind of pushed back out. It had come all the way into 26 miles, but it's back out at about 30 now, uh, you know, from the, from the past two weeks. And that's kind of taken some of that current off of the cones, and I think that's what's increased that bite. I got you. Okay. All right. That sounds good. I, I think our Wahoo fishing is going to pick up in October. October, it certainly should, um, as our water temperature continues to drop. It's going to be interesting to me, just because I love fishing for them so much, it's going to be interesting to see if we're going to have a sea bass season this year. It started out gangbusters last year, and it lasted about two weeks. It was gone for the rest of, <laughs> for the rest of the winter, but I'm almost starting to get worried, Jimmy, about how many red snapper we've got, and are they eating uh, so many other fish off the reef that that it's going to be tough to get for millions and sea bass and our usual wintertime fish. I have the same concerns, and yes, they are. Yeah, I think you're right, Cap. <laughs> I, I appreciate it as always. Please tell me we can check with you next week. 
I look forward to it, Rick. Thanks so much. Captain Jim Ross from East Central Florida bringing us the report there where things took a little bit of an unexpected downturn. Thank God for Mangrove Snapper this year. Boy, there's been a ton of them all over the state. All right, now we're going to my favorite little fishing village, Stewart, Florida, to talk to Captain John Earhart. Captain John, how's it going? Going, going good, Rick. I'm glad to be here. Well, we're certainly glad to have you. God, I've been kind of out of touch with Stuart. Any fishing going on down there? Yeah, yeah. Offshore fishing's been uh, pretty steady. Uh, we're not seeing as many sailfish uh, lately. You know, we're catching one to three a trip. Uh, it seems like we've had more mahi this week and uh, a lot of nicer blackfin tunas, surprisingly. And the, the blackfin tuna action's been in about 140 feet of water. And the mahi action's been out, you know, anywhere from 90 to about 180, you know. But if you're just going after mahi, you could go out as deep as 1,500 feet if you're just only going to focus on mahi and wahoo this time of year. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's definitely plenty of pelagic action. We're getting a, a few cobia inshore on the on the six and the eight mile reef, some snappers, a few groupers, and a lot of kingfish as well. You know, using dead sardines. Live baits that we can come by them, and uh, a lot, of, a lot of live finger mullet. You know, because you can catch a bunch of finger mullet before you head offshore right now, and it's just it's easy to have those in the live well in case you can't get the desired live baits. You know, and you can you can make do with the dead sardines on the bottom or on the surface while you're sitting on anchor. Mm-hmm. I tell you what, I love using not necessarily finger mullet, but the little bit bigger mullet for sailfish, just because. It's such a gorgeous show. The sailfish have such a hard time chasing down a big mullet and eating it. And it just it makes for more excitement because that bait is glued to the top of the water, if not jumping out of the water. I mean, you don't ever get a surprise strike on a mullet, it seems like. It seems like they almost always drop them to the surface. Yeah, you, you certainly can tell you're about to get a bite because your mullet will be all nonchalant, barely moving around, and all of a sudden he's, he's back behind the boat doing cartwheels, right. and you know it's about right. to be game on. Yep, yep. That the sight of that big purple sheet coming after him sure wakes him up in a hurry. That's for sure. John, how long have you been chartering out of Stewart now? Uh, this would be about my fifteenth year now. All right. I want to know. Uh, I just called you from Minnesota. I'm. Uh, my name is Fred and Ethel Mertz, and we're coming down for our one hundredth wedding anniversary, and we want to go fishing. What's your go-to fish when you've got people that aren't used to? Uh, to, to being great anglers what what what's the basis of your business my, my go-to fish would probably be the snook honestly i mean that's that's the most common fish in stewart inshore or if i was going offshore it would probably be the sailfish you know it, it depends on the, on the season really i mean we just have so many fish here but i'd say i'd say snook would be the the number one easiest fish to catch if you don't have a whole lot of fishing experience all right what makes you a good snook guide uh just uh, really having a live bait, honestly, mm-hmm. having having a having a good idea where the live bait is, and that's that's going to make it pretty easy. And you know, when you go out 15 years in a row, you're gonna you're gonna know where they like to hang out. Gotcha. All right, that's outstanding. All right, well, that sounds really good. I, I appreciate the heck out of it, John. I I think your sailfish are going to start picking up as it gets a little cooler, and uh, I want you to keep me posted on that mahi run. I'm I'm ready to come down and pound on some mahi. Yeah, I haven't seen anybody catch one bigger than 41 pounds yet, but they've been getting a lot of 10 to 15 pounders. So, I mean, it's, it's been good for Stewart. I, l- I look forward to telling you about some bigger ones next week, hopefully. You give me those 10 to 15 all day long. I'll be a happy man. Thank you, John. Thank you, Rick. All right, Captain John Earhart from the chaos and the mayhem out of Stewart. Time to head on down south. Let's check in with Captain Alan Sherman. But you know what? First... Let's hear a word from our sponsors at Shimano. The year was 1953 when one of the true pioneers of big game fishing just hung it up. I tell you what, it wasn't one of our action spotters, but it was none other than Ernest Hemingway. I just don't want to do it anymore, he's credited with saying. The tackle has become so sophisticated, the fish dose don't have a chance. Can you imagine walking him through the aisles of strike zone fishing and showing him the latest and greatest from Shimano? Can you imagine handling him a Saragossa spinner that weighed less than his bait and could put more torque on a rampaging tuna than the giant old reels of his day? No, Ernest, I'm afraid you left us way too early, buddy. 
The fights with great fish still go on today, and guess what? Sometimes we still get beat. But if I were a sea monster of your days, I think I'd rather do battle with you than face the tools that Shimano has stocked in Strike Zone some 68 years later. Our thanks to John Earhart for a great Stewart report. Now let's pull down south a little ways. We know what's happening on South Beach because Captain Alan Sherman keeps us informed. Alan, how are you? Doing fine, Rick. I got a question for you, real yes, quick. Yes, sir. You got your thermals out yet? No, but man, it feels good up here. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 it feels good up here. I bet it does. I heard uh, a rumor like fifty-eight degrees. Is that true? No, we didn't hear. We didn't get that low, but we got we got down into the mid sixties. And uh, I, it's so funny, and I've seen this my whole life. My wife and I are driving home. We have to drive like over three bridges to get out onto the island to get to our house. And we're driving over a bridge, and there's probably a dozen people fishing on it at 1 o'clock in the morning. And she said, oh, the trout must be biting. I said, baby, I don't think so. Tide's wrong. And she said, what are they doing out there at 1 o'clock in the morning? I said, Debbie, they don't know. And she said, what do you mean they don't know? I said, it's instinct. Men, yeah. we don't know why when these cool fronts come and the weather changes, it's time to go hunt and gather. I mean, I I, I saw at least a half a dozen boats getting towed away from the boat ramp near my house on that drive at 1 o'clock in the morning. They just all of a sudden all wanted to go fishing, Alan. Well, it's a migration, you know. That's what everybody's got on their minds. Me too. You know, I can't wait until tomorrow to get back on the water to see what else has uh, showed up. There you go. How's fishing? It's not bad. The, the fishing offshore, you know, if you're looking for dolphin, uh, you still got to hunt a little bit. <laughs> They've been out as far as 2,400 feet. <laughs> that's, a, that's a trek. Was that but, the Mariana uh, Trench or something? <laughs> I know. It, and, it, you know, years ago, nobody would ever go out that far, but the sword, the sword fishermen fish that far offshore. And, they're running into dolphin out there. Not only are they running into dolphin, they're running into the patches of weeds and the weed lines, which we haven't seen a whole lot of in shallower. Although there were some fish caught as shallow as 800 feet and some reports of some good mats of weeds and fish up to 20 pounds and over 20 pounds mm. caught this week. So good. there are some dolphin out there to target. Good. But closer in around the reef, it's been quite a few kingfish. Uh, you know, like the... Fall migration kingfish, uh, probably five pounds, seven pounds, but in some decent numbers. So, you know, that's a fish targetable. And uh, with them has been, of course, the bonitas, a few blackfin tunas, and there's been a few sailfish caught this week, more so than there was last week. So maybe this weather has pushed a few sailfish into our area. Uh, on the reefs and the wrecks, uh, on the wrecks, they're getting some amberjacks, some big amberjacks few uh, mutton snappers, a few groupers, but some big amberjacks. And then at night on the reefs, they're doing well on uh, snappers, mostly yellowtails. Uh, we haven't really seen any mackerel or bluefish show up with the bait fish schools that we've gotten, but that should happen any day here as uh, these bait fish schools keep moving down. And I think we have another front coming down if I heard right. So uh, definitely something's going to happen here soon. There's been some big crevels, some small tarpons, some snook in the bay, a few sea trout. And then, uh, shoot, there was one other thing. There were some muttons and some yellow jacks and small groupers on the patch reefs down mm -hmm. in South Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, fishing in Flamingo has been excellent. A lot of snook, redfish, uh, triple tail, tarpon. You got it all going on down there. Well, just, just remember, when I'm president, two Mays... Two Octobers, no August, no February. Okay? I love it. So I, I love uh, it. Get ready for the first of our two Octobers. Thank you so much, Alan. <laughs> we look forward to talking with you next week. Enjoy your dinner. Thank you very much, Rick. Thank you, buddy. Take care. <laughs> now, it's time to go where everybody wants to be. All right? No matter where you live, you want to be in Ala Mirada, Florida. And, you know, we've, we've talked with Nish Stanzik now for well over a year and God bless Nick, he's got another baby at home now. He's He's got one in each hand. He can't talk to us for a little while. So we're going to put Brandon Storen on the spot. 
Brandon is one of the young captains out of Bud and Mary's. Does a great job. You may know him as Captain Bean. But, Brandon, we really are happy to welcome you to the Florida Sportsman Action Spotter podcast. How are you, my boy? I'm doing good. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for including me. We're glad to have you. You live in paradise, as you well know. And I know that you're one of the top guides out of there. I understand you had quite a trip yesterday. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I uh, took a six-year-old kid coop fishing. And uh, yesterday was Alan Rada Kids Fishing Derby, little tournament they put on for the kids. Uh, Coop and I end up fishing in uh, backcountry. He got second place in his division uh, with a four-pound triple tail. Oh, he, uh, okay. Yeah, he came, yeah, and then he came in second place to a uh, five-pound Jack Cravel, but uh, he also caught the uh, largest mango snapper overall out of all the different age groups, so you was psyched about that as well. How about that? Well, that's fantastic. Well, congratulations to your your young angler. What's been biting offshore? Offshore, uh, some good blackfin tuna's been showing up around the hump. You can still run to a couple groups of mahi if you find a couple birds working or if you find a piece of debris. Um, we're definitely seeing some things starting to show up on the reef that we're getting to that seasonal transition. Summer is ending, fall is coming around the corner. So they're uh, getting some good mutton snappers on the reef. Some um, mackerels are showing up. Um, also, there's been a sailfish here and there spotted. So that's cool that hopefully we have them making their way down and have a good sailfish season coming up. Um, so, yeah, it's just kind of starting to lean off the mahi, kind of starting to get more into the reef. It's been a great. Um, yellow tail snapper bite as well oh, that's fantastic that sounds good that sounds good now how many how many guys have you got running out of there now that's one of the most popular charter boat destinations in florida yep we have uh 24 backcountry guides um additional four bay boat guides uh, and then we have about 20 or so offshore captains that run a big boats offshore so cool. you, you're looking at about close to 50 captains that run out of Mary. Wow, that is that is absolutely fantastic. Well, we appreciate you uh, sitting in with us this evening and uh, keep them straight down there, if you will. And if it's all right, we're going to talk with you next week. We'll give you a call about this time. Perfect. Love to be here. Thanks, Brandon. Captain Brandon you, Storen. You know what Yamaha Outboards love? The genuine formula and consistency of Yamalu Marine Engine Oils. Blood, 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 blood. Outboards are subjected to punishing conditions like high loads, salt, and humidity, a mix that automotive oils can't handle. Yamalu full synthetic and marine performance formulas are certified to protect against friction and corrosion for reliable performance every time. Ah. Find Yamalu marine oils at your nearest Yamaha outboard dealer. Locate them at yamahaoutboards.com backslash dealers. Yamaha, reliability starts here. Hey, Raj, you know, being consistent is a mark of a quality product. If you've been Florida's number one chum for over 10 years, there's got to be a reason. For 10 years, Tournament Master Chum has lived up to his name. That's why more tournament pros insist on Tournament Master than any other chum. It's the only chum with Menhaden milk mixed right in. That means it gets a scent out faster and deeper than any other brand of chum. It comes in a grind size for every species from kingfish to catch and bait. Your fishing time is way too precious to use second-rate chum. Bring the action to you by insisting on Tournament Master Chum. It's worth every penny. When you're ready for the finest in custom-made flat spay or inshore-offshore hybrids, you are ready to meet the Young family in Inglis, Florida. For over 21 years, the Young family has built custom boats one at a time for every type of fishing. Nothing can sneak up on a flat quite like the Gulf Shore Flats boats, and I've never fished a better hybrid than the Young 24s and 27s. Rob Young is a naval architect who takes tremendous pride in each and every build for each and every customer that wants their boat custom-built exactly the way they want want it. Is it time for you to move up? Are you ready to own the finest boat built? Then you need to visit the Young Boat Facility in Inglis, Florida, or check them out online at youngboats.com. Our thanks to Captain Brandon Storn in Ala Mirada, who gave us a great report. Sound like he had a good tournament yesterday, catching a triple tail and a nice Jack Cravel for his youth angler to put him in second place. Now, Let's move on over into 10,000 Islands and find out what Captain Steve Dahl is up to. Steve, how are you? I'm doing great. Good, good. How's your weather holding down there? It's Today is actually Chamber of Commerce weather. Mm -hmm. It's uh, 
It literally is a little warm, but the humidity is just not there. That front that you're probably getting is uh, not necessarily cooling it off, but it literally has given, uh, given us some relief from the humidity. So hopefully this is uh, the sign to come. Yep, yep. Just, just remember, when I'm president, two Octobers, two Octobers, yep. two Mays, no Februarys, <laughs> I no remember. August. Okay? You, you got my vote. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. And what you been catching this week? It's been good. Uh, you know, it's, you know, we've always, uh, for the last probably three weeks, we've been talking about how, you know, maybe we were touching on an early fall and with the redfish being as good as they are. And I, I'm super excited to see what October is going to, you know, bring with some cooler weather because if these fish are here now, we're going to have just a banner, banner redfish season this October. And, uh, that's what it's got everybody kind of really, geeked up a little bit down here about it you know i don't think we've ever had as good of a september uh both for redfish and snook i mean our snook fishing you know it's probably a little bit more relevant to you know the warmer water temperatures but you know having both this time of year uh in earnest is just fantastic so um pretty much the same pattern all the fish are kind of seem to be on the outside islands at least from the redfish standpoint uh that's probably where they're going to stay you know pretty much through mid-november um, and we'll just see bigger concentrations of them. And, you know, I talk about it, I don't kind of often about that pattern, but, you know, it's really kind of a run and gun type of thing. Um, put the live bait down and have some fun with some artificials is really, really the way to go. It's just cause you can cover so much more water and, uh, the snooker not going to be out as far on these outside points as the redfish. So if you want snook, uh, they're not far, you just got to move up and uh, fish close to the mangroves. Even on some of the lower tide stages, these fish are sitting as close as they can to those mangroves. And uh, that's the time you actually want to catch them because they can't get you into as much trouble. Uh, we all know what big snook can do when you get them hooked. <laughs> so uh, those little bit lower tide stages, you have a much better shot of landing some of those bigger fish if you can uh, steer them away from um, the little bit of mangroves that are in the water at those lower tides. So. Um, that's kind of my recommendation for the week, you know, stay in shore. Uh, we're getting a little bit of windy conditions. It's looking like this week, uh, nothing to really keep you offshore, but, uh, the fishing's so good in shore, you know, there's really no reason to run out to be honest with you. I got it. It always tickles me. And, and I just got off the phone. We we're doing the Northeast report with David Boris who hooked a monster snook, um, earlier this week and it, it just happens as it so often does. He found a pylon and that was the end of that. And, and it's funny yep. to me how the creator gave different fish, different defenses, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> a sailfish is going to jump and do cartwheels and try and throw that hook like crazy. And a snook and a grouper always know where the closest piling is, you know, or the yeah, closest rock ledge. They, they just, yeah. they just instinctively know. Now, conversely, a red snapper doesn't know. No, it doesn't. You know, he just <laughs> fights. But a grouper, yep. a grouper's got a method to his madness every single time. He does. So does the snook. Does. Uh, let me ask you something, Steve. It, my name sure. is, is uh, Fred and Ethel Mertz, and we are okay. celebrating our 100th wedding anniversary. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're coming down from the Copacabana. We've never been fishing before. Love it. Um, uh, what's your go-to and what makes you good at it? Uh, it, it would probably be triple tail. You really? know, I think, uh, yeah, it really is. I, uh, given the season, if I got the right season, um, that's just my very favorite thing to do. I, I've really turned a lot of novice fishermen onto that. Cause I think there's something about seeing, especially a substantial size triple tail, you know, when you can visually see a fish, um, and be able to catch it and see the whole thing unfold. And uh, there's a little bit of hunting involved in those, you know, at least um, not so much just trying to find them, but even the setup, so many factors go into that. You know, you can, sometimes they don't want to bite. You can kind of come back to them and, you know, approach it from a different angle. There's so many little tricks and nuances that you can do to try to get those fish to eat. And uh, it's just fun. I just think the visual aspect, you know, anything sight fishing, but for some reason, triple tail is just the coolest thing for me i just absolutely love it and anytime i can kind of pass that on to somebody i'm i'm all about it so 
All right, one one bait say. for triple tail. What would it be? Uh, it's got to be just a, a you know for me a three aught you know owner circle hook three line on twenty five pound test uh, fluorocarbon and a and a live shrimp. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, that's really my deal. I uh, I tend to nip off the very back tail portion of it um, and hook it through the tail sideways mm-hmm. and. Uh, doesn't look as natural, but I think that extra little bit of scent maybe helps. It's not kind of always worked for me, and uh, that's kind of how I've always approached that. And, um, you know, if they're really, really finicky, then I'll start playing with different rigging methods of the shrimp to make it look a little bit more natural, but kind of tone them backwards, <laughs> you know. But uh, nine out of ten times, that seems to work for me. I, I just became a better triple tail fisherman. Thank you, Steve. We appreciate the heck out of it. Please tell me we can check with you next week. Oh, I can't wait, Rick. Can't Thanks, wait. buddy. Captain Steve Dahl from 10,000 Islands checking in, teaching us how to catch triple tail. Now, let's move up into the southwest, talk with our old friend from Snook Stamp Charters, Captain Greg Stamper. Can you hear me, Snooky? I can hear you loud and clear, Rick. How are you doing? Doing outstanding, man. It's a little chilly in the air up here in northeast Florida. Have you felt any temperature change yet? <laughs> Yeah, I think the feels like today was around 94, so fall was definitely in the air. <laughs> I'm not sure 94 counts, Cap. I'm not, I'm not sure that counts. How's your fishing? A little, a little, a little bit less on the humidity. I can, I can give you that, but uh, we're, we're still kind of crawling through the dog days. I, it won't be long until we start feeling some of that beautiful weather you guys have up there. You know, you know when I can feel it first, Greg, in all seriousness, is at dawn. And, yeah. and, and I so often get up at dawn and go outside. And, and when yeah. I do, you just, you almost have to imagine it, but you can feel that little bit of chill just starting. And you go, huh? I like this. Yep. I'm, I'm right there with you. For me, it's when the noceum stop biting me that's, early in the morning. That's right. That's exactly right. Tell me about your fishing. Oh, fishing's been good. I tell you what, you know, with a, we talked about redfish before, how Red October kind of came in early. Uh, that has continued to be the case. We did have a little bit of a, a lull in our tides. In other words, we're starting to move towards a winter tide pattern. In about another month and a half or so, we're going to have those really low lows down here that start in November, December. But we're starting to see that transition from having high tides in the morning to having low tides. So we've had a little difficulty sometimes getting to where these fish are and being in front of them at the right time. But the fish we are catching are very nice. They're all big fish. We're talking fish that are either right at the top of the upper slot or over. The cool part about it, Rick, is the trout fishing is right there with them. If you can't get to those redfish, just bounce back into about another foot and a half, two feet of water. Throw either top water in the morning early or the good old popping cork with a DOA shrimp under it. You'll, you'll catch as many as you want. Now, uh, you say that um, when you're talking about a pop and cork early or a top water early rather. Um, what time early, does yeah. that, what time does that generally shut off? When do you have to go to, to a pop and cork? In a so um, I, I'm a sucker for top water. I'll throw yep. top water all day if they're biting it. But quite honestly, for me, I like to do those first hour or two, but if you keep an overcast sky, you can go as long as you want. I think that those fish that are looking up, if that's overcast up of them, they don't bother. They don't care. They're going to hit it no matter what. I think when you get that sun up, it kind of bothers their eyes a little bit, and they're not as much to chase. Greg, you have hit a nail on the head, and I tell people all the time when I'm doing seminars, if you want to know if a fish is a, a sunshine feeder or a dark feeder, look at his eyes. You look at a blackfin yep. tuna, he's got big eyes on top of his head. He, uh-uh, he ain't going to stare up into that bright sun. He's going to be down a little bit deeper. You look at a mahi, yep. he's got a little bitty eye over on the side of his head. You can catch him on the brightest day of the year. So, so I, I think you're That's absolutely right. right. Study, study That's your right. fish, and you can tell the time of day that it feeds. Well, to echo off of you, what you just said, I'll give you a little offshore report this week. I have a good buddy. He's not a guide. He's a private guy. He's got a really nice boat that can run out very, very far, and he's not worried about blowing fuel. He got out there way out there, about 70 miles plus. He ran into a bunch of shrimp boats, and normally he likes to go after those tuna that are under the shrimp boats as they throw a bycatch. Right. He said he got out there, he chummed, he couldn't catch a tuna to save his life, all they kept catching were bonitas. But one thing he did tell me, it was a perfect bluebird sky day, and it was 
flat, calm, Rick. So that goes along with exactly what you just said. That's it. Look at the Benita versus the tuna. Benita's got a little yep. eye over on the side of his head. Yep. yep. Black Finn's got the so big eye they did catch some snapper. Yep. They did catch some snapper, Rick. They did. They did get the snapper. You got a little bit of closures on some of these groupers, so they just did the snapper fishing after the two wood to the wood spot. And that brings us back to the inshore and nearshore guys. They're doing very well again. These permit are not going to go anywhere. And I tell you what, we're looking forward to Rick. It's all these fish coming from up north as you get that cool weather. Thank you very much. <laughs> we're sending them your way. Thank you, Greg Stamper. Please tell me we can check with you next week. Uh, absolutely. I'll see you then. Bye. Thanks so much. Captain Greg Snapper from Snook Stamp Charters. Let's move on up to the West Central area and talk with Ray Markham. Ray, how are you? Awesome. Good deal. <laughs> Ask anybody. <laughs> Tell me about uh, fishing in your area. Oh, man, I'm telling you, uh, it's getting better and better by the day. And in fact, I'd almost say by the hour. Um, this little front that passed through here a couple days ago, well, four or five days ago, actually has done some wonders for us. Um, air temperature isn't super cool, but it's definitely, you can tell the difference in the morning going outside. But uh, I think the fish have really, really seen a difference in this. And, and what's even more, I think the fish that are coming down from the panhandle are sure seeing it because we had kingfish showing up on the beaches this weekend. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh Lots and lots of Spanish mackerel inside the bays, outside, along near shore and offshore waters. Uh, we had redfish that were just absolutely crazy hitting uh, cut baits around uh, mangrove islands and o- oyster bars. Tons and tons of snook. We're absolutely going crazy around dock lights this week. I've had a lot of people um, telling me dock light fishing has been outrageously good. Live shrimp has been uh, a top bait, guys that are fly fishing. Uh, and throwing uh, uh, shrimp patterns are doing really well, along with glass minnow patterns. Speaking of glass minnows, you get just offshore, uh, and you're going to find some tarpon that are still feeding on schools of glass minnows right along with the Spanish mackerel in there. And while you're on your way out there, uh, keep an eye out for all kinds of things floating in the water because triple tailor action is picking up. Guys that are chucking a DOA shrimp or a live shrimp at any of the um, debris that's floating in the water are picking them up. And for guys that are p- uh, fishing the passes, we've had some real good action picking up on pompano. Uh, Doc Scoopy jigs and naked ball jigs both have been uh, uh, doing real well over the past week or two for us. Um, let's see, what else we got going on? Oh, mangrove snapper. Did I mention mangrove snapper? Shoot. Ray, They're everywhere. Ray, yeah. I'm gonna tell you, it's a statewide epidemic. I have every everybody I talk to has said the same thing this year. Thank God for mangrove snapper. When the fish I'll take turn them off, over we can still catch, any day. Yep. When the fish turn <laughs> off, we can still catch mangrove snapper. Yeah, buddy. Yep, well, that's and it. Uh, as we get a little bit cooler, hogfish. Look for hogfish. There's a few <sighs> being caught, but I think they like this cooler weather. And as that gets a little bit cooler. Next couple of cold fronts, we'll start seeing a little more steady action on them. Mm, I, I can't complain about any of this. <laughs> Ray, how long have we been doing this podcast together? Probably almost, five, ten minutes at least. Almost two years. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. I've never heard you so encouraged about your fishing. It's It's got to be good. Well, you know, it, it, you, they can't be everywhere. Right. And, you know, that's just fishing. If, if, if you're not out often enough – you're going to be struggling a little bit to find them and, and do it on a regular basis. But, um, you know, we've had so many issues with red tide over the past few years, and we're struggling to get over it. We, I think slowly we're seeing some headway being made. Uh, come middle of October, they're going to take a look at uh, drought or redfish snook drought and everything else. So, you know, hopefully it'll be a good sign. Things will all open back up, and, and we'll have a shot at them again. So, um, you know, I'm looking forward to it, but things are looking up. Well, makes makes my heart feel good to, to hear you so uh, excited and, and, and anticipating great fishing soon. We appreciate the it, heck it, out of it, Ray. Please tell me we can check with you next week. 
Yes, sir, you certainly can. I'll do my 100-hour service on my motor tomorrow, and I'll be out ripping them up again the next day. Hey, I got, <laughs> I got, I got two 200s if you're bored. You can come right on over here and do them. I've got two Yamahas of my own that need a little work, so we're all good, buddy. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Ray. You take care. Okay. We're going to head on up into the Big Bend area and check with William Tony. But before we do that, let's hear a word from DOA. Man, it's still hot, and that means the water's still hot. It's starting to cool a little. But as for now, the great fish are where we always find them this time of year down deep. They're going to be attempting to stay cool. Well, you name it. If it feeds deeper in the water column, it can't refuse a DOA terrorize. It dives straight down and crawls across the bottom with an action that no deep feeder can resist. Whether it's a crappie deep under some lily pads or a tarpon rooting around the bridge pilings, DOA makes a size and color terrorize that they just can't say no to. Flashing that big bright eye in front of any bottom feeding game fish is just unfair. Well, maybe that's why they call DOA lures the unfair advantage. Our thanks to Ray Markham for for what's got to be the best West Central report he's ever given us. Ray Markham in a good mood about fish. How about that? William Tony up in the Big Bend. That's news, isn't it? That's right. You know what? We're always happy up here in the Big Bend, especially getting into the cool part of the year. You know, all the transition and all the good fishing that we're looking forward to coming up here you know close to october mm, yes it is yes it is um had a big eight point at the feeder last night so oh man i you know same same on this side you know and get one close enough to seal the deal i had a nice doe under my stand the other day but about 15 yards away but on the wrong side of me so i couldn't turn to shoot it was just too thick but you know what? It was a great experience and it didn't matter anyways. I still had a good hunt. It's a great day in the woods, wasn't it? Absolutely. I'm with you. Tell me about your fishing. Well, you know what you can look forward to on the Big Bend now is catching about everything. And you know what? I, I kind of wrote my report this week on the Big Bend there with Florida Sportsman about topwater plugs. And, you know, it gets to the point where right now a lot of our grass is starting to slowly get out of the way. So topwater plugs, you know, can be a really good tool to get some really good strikes, especially the trout and your redfish and your snook. And then if you like shallow water, shallow running plugs, you can get out there and get into those shallow water grouper now too. So, you know, it's, it's nice to have some shrimp in the boat or some pinfish, but you can get away without that. If you just want to get out there and have some fun and catch some fish with topwater plugs. Oh, that's got to be an awful lot of fun. And we don't ever get to do grouper on plugs over here on the East Coast. So, you know, it's funny how you always covet what you don't have. And, and um, I'm, I'm bad about that. I, I, I really wish we had. I've seen video. My friend Rob Young has video of them catching really nice gags on chuggers on topwater chuggers and that just that fires me up now it, it is pretty cool i know you're over there it gets pretty deep fast but here along the big bend and most parts until you get up real high up around there to where it gets up in the panhandle area rule of thumb it drops one foot per mile here so when the water temperature is right those those fish those gags will move in shallow following the bait schools and they get on those rocks, and a lot of times you can catch them on a shallow running plug like a Bomber Long A. Oh, the Rapala uh, F-14s and F-18s are very popular. Uh, and and you could get, what, what I suggest, if you do have numbers or anything and want to give it a shot, don't throw directly across the top of the rock. Go to the left or right side of the rock and get the fish to chase it out from underneath that structure. So when they hit it, you've already gained a little bit of foothold and get them away from it because if it's a big fish he'll rally you real quick there's no up and down in this in this type of fishing it's a real big tug of war and i've had fish break 30 pound you know braid like a 22 rifle pop when they hit it real hard so you gotta check that drag you want it just tight enough that it's really hard to pull without cutting your hand but you want to have enough give in it that you know they can run five to ten feet without popping it real hard and like I said, those plugs you want to throw either right or left side of the rock. If you throw right over, you're taking a big chance of putting it right there in the house, and he's going to go right back in the house. 
No. So you want to get them to you want to get them to run out and chase it, and you're going to get a lot of short fish. You know the 20 inch um, you know rule on keeping gags here. That's that's a big fish. That's a five and a half six pound grouper. But you'll get a lot of 18 and 20 inch uh, fish that will you'll feel like you really you know they'll snatch your arms out of socket the same. But when it comes down to the big boy, the the man of the rock, you better be prepared. That's a that's a great piece of advice, William. Do you use the shock leader at all? Do you have any mono, or do you go straight braid I, all I, over your plug? No, I do. I use a 60-pound uh, fluorocarbon leader, and a lot of times what I do is uh, tie a spider hitch onto my onto my shock leader. And uh, I like that mono for one, one reason. If I can, you know, it's hard to throw a three-foot leader with such a big knot in the eye of a heavy spinning rod because, you know, you don't want to rip the eye out of the pole. So about 18 to 20 inches, but then that gives you just a little bit of grace. If it does happen to hit a rock or get down there to where you have to really get on them and pull them out, uh, longer would be better, but then you're slinging such a heavy plug. You really need to have a little bit of a shorter leader. You might go as far as 24 inches, but, uh, you know, that, that, 60 pound fluorocarbon leader is going to handle a rock a lot better than 30 pound braid, 30 pound braid of Nick in it. And it pulls hard. It's going to bust real quick. That's a great piece of advice. And I, what, when, uh, when do you look for that to happen? What time of year is best for that? It it's going on right now. You know, I used to do a lot of inshore grouper. I don't do it much anymore uh, on charters, you know, on our area and all, all uh, offshore guys got to have a federal reef permit. So if you're with a with a charter over here, make sure they have that reef permit, or you're going to be having this fish in state waters, which is nine miles, and basically that's going to be nine or ten feet of water. So you know, getting out and and sometimes you got to go a little deeper, twelve to fourteen foot to get on them. To you know, so if you're on a charter, but if you're just a recreational angler, the sky is the limit as far out as you want to run. But when we're talking shallow water, it can happen as shallow as seven feet. I saw a couple of posts on uh, Facebook this past week where anglers went out, you know, starting at 20 foot out to 25 foot. No luck. Came back in and caught their keeper grouper in about seven to eight feet. How about that? So as the water temperature drops, I believe those fish will follow the bait back inshore. And uh, that's, that's where they're at, you know, a little bit shallower. So, you may want to reverse it. A lot of times people run deep and work back shallow on their way home. You may want to start shallow and work your way deep. Gotcha. Excellent. Great report, William. I appreciate the heck out of it so much. Please tell me we can check with you next week. I'll be right here in downtown Homestass, <laughs> and hopefully I got. I can tell you about I'm eating me some backstrap, uh, fried backstrap, rice and gravy over here, and, and uh, that's what I've been working on in my free time when I'm not fishing. Well, I, I, I'm not expecting the phone lines to be working that well next week. So if that is the case, call me a day or two before. I think we could do. I think we could do that live. We just put yeah, that absolutely. Between us. We'll be all right. You know what? If we, you know, if we could get Doctor Spock, you know, and Captain Kirk <laughs> to come over here, I will put it right there, and we will trans, transform you a plate you, of that backstrap rice and gravy over there to your house, and I'm, we can enjoy it. I'm fatter already. Thank you, William. I appreciate it. <laughs> Take care, buddy. Our thanks to William Tony for a great Big Bend report. Now we get to head over into the northwest section and check in with Captain Kevin Lanier from KC Sport Fishing Adventures. Kevin, how are you? Hey, Captain Rick, we're doing just fine today. How about yourself? Doing outstanding, loving this cooler weather, buddy. Oh, you and me both. There's nothing like going from a sauna to a nice, cool breeze. Yep. Yep, yep. Like you said, your tail was wagging. I feel the same way. <laughs> Any fishing going on up in the northwest area? Oh, yeah, we're doing a little bit of fishing out here. We got a pleasant surprise yesterday. We went out for some black snapper. And you know how much I love using that flat line. Oh, that yeah. That flat line went off, and it was just a screaming. And we fought that fish, moved the boat around a little bit. And lo and behold, about 30-pound black fin tuna Ooh. came on board. You know what? That's just a bad animal. I mean, I have caught lazy sailfish. I have caught lazy dolphin. I've caught a lot of, I ain't never, ever in my life caught a lazy blackfin tuna. Oh, I don't think I've ever, 
Only, only lazy black fin tuna I ever caught was one of sharp with the tail. Yeah, off that don't count, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> in fact, I was fortunate enough off of Stewart about a month ago to have one, and a shark came up and bit the tail. And he was big. He was 26, probably. And a shark came up and bit the tail off of him, and that was it. That's all he took. And I'm like, thank you very much. <laughs> you, yeah. You, you stopped him, and you bled him out for me, and I appreciate it. Well, let me tell you something else. So, you know, anytime there's one black fin tuna around, you got to assume there's more than one. Uh-huh. So we go back then, we do that same drift again, and two rods go off this time. Hello. And I'm all excited. I'm thinking, man, we're going to all eat tuna today. And we fought those fish, and lo and behold, that endangered red snapper came up. Yeah. Both of them about 15, 18 pounds out on the flat line. Yeah. I know they were terrorizing the Kingfish tournament guys uh, a little earlier uh, this summer up here. I mean, uh, you, 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 good gracious, you got a bait skipping across top of the water and catch a red snapper. I mean, it's just gotten, oh, I know it's gotten crazy. Yeah. It's just gotten yeah. crazy. Hey, did you hear what Louisiana did? I did. Isn't that sweet? I know. You know, you got to say. You know, I, I give. Uh, I give a big kudo to the state of Louisiana because those guys over there have been hurting through all the storms the last couple of years, and I am just so glad that they stepped up and gave those guys some extra time and extra fish. Yeah, and, and they're going to learn that um, that their fishing's not going to collapse. Uh, it, it's not going to collapse when we keep four, Kevin. It collapsed when we kept 50. And, uh, oh, exactly. I, you know, and, and, and I think that the whole world is going to soon see that, that this closure is ridiculous. But what's biting besides blackfin tuna and red snapper? Well, we're getting some uh, nice uh, trout. Uh, trout fishing has been really good, especially along the, uh, uh, you know, we've got a place over here we call Crooked Island Sound. Uh, those areas close uh, to the Gulf, uh, the, uh, they're doing real well. Uh, we're still chasing that herd of redfish friend of mine today got a really nice redfish off the uh, jetty outside the Port St. Joe Marina. Um, black drum, uh, all kinds of stuff. So, there, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity out there. You know, those pompanos should be coming back through up here on the panhandle here pretty soon. And, uh, you know, really, right now, is, uh, like we've talked about before, right now, to me, is the best time to be out here fishing. I'm with you. I'm with you. Give me two Octobers, no August, September. I'll be fine. Cap, we, oh, I agree with you. <laughs> we appreciate the heck out of it so much. And, and uh, keep the Blackfin tuna straight out, out there till we talk to you next week, if that's okay. Oh, I'm certainly going to try. I'm going to try to get out there next week and get a couple more if they're out there. Good deal. Our thanks to Captain Kevin Lanier and all of our action spotters this week for what has been a very upbeat report. Golly, it was great to hear everybody talk about how good the fishing is since this water has cooled off just a little bit, David Boris is up to his ears in redfish, and uh, they've been get, been in the flooded grass on these high tides. Guana Dam ran this week. The trout bit very, very well. The surf is full of mullet. You want to catch a jack, you want to catch a kingfish, a tarpon, a shark, a redfish, a trout, a flounder. They're all chasing the mullet down the beach in northeast and east central Florida. Jim Ross saw a little sh- slowdown over the last two days from his mullet run, but that won't last long, I promise you. Captain John Earhart, as we moved down the coast, reported quite a few mahi. Said a good number of tuna, big black fins, and a handful of mahi, and uh, a sail or two, but not a whole lot. It's not uh, sail time. Captain Alan Sherman, talking about how the mahi picked up down in South Florida this week. They're also having excellent inshore fishing with the mullet starting to filter all the way down to Miami. It was fun to welcome Captain Brandon Storen to the report this week. He fished a tournament over the weekend with a five-year-old angler and had excellent action inshore on Triple Tail and Jack Creval. Coming up the southwest area all through the 10,000 islands and up into west central, redfish seem to be everywhere, and banner, banner snook fishing. You can catch live mullet for bait, but you don't really need to. Throw in a DOA terrorize, throw in a DOA bait buster will certainly put fish in your boat this time of year. Captain Kevin Lanier says offshore is good. Red snapper are too thick. We already knew that. He did have a nice black fin tuna yesterday. So all in all, it's been a good week. We do have another northeaster on the way. All that'll do is hasten the migrations, bring us more fish down from up north. It's only going to get better from here on out, guys. Man, I can't wait to hit the water again. Until next week. 
for Yamaha. Reliability starts here for Shimano, bringing people and nature together. For Tournament Master Chum, the best chum on earth. For Nassara Paradise Reynolds, your dream vacation. For DOA Lures, the unfair advantage. And for Young Boats, you want the finest in flat Spain offshore hybrids, you need to check out Young Boats. Until next week, for Florida Sports and Magazine, I'm Captain Rick Riles, and we'll see you on the rig.